They say they specialize in therapy, confidence, and behavior. But could your teen's next camp specialize in torture? Please get me out of here. The cause of death is homicide. Victim after victim speaks out. I just thought suicide was better than living in this place. Then they are identical twins except for one major problem. Can the doctors get to the bottom of this multiples mystery? Well, what did the test find? There's a bigger issue here. All new. Sure subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. Teens we know can be moody, rebellious, even downright defiant, leaving parents struggling with ways to cope. The question is how far would you go to fix a troubled teen? The multi-billion dollar troubled teen industry is made up of thousands of private wilderness boot camps and institutions that promise to fix kids' behavioral problems. But it's here in these programs that we uncovered teens being tormented and tortured. The practice started in the late 1950s with a drug rehabilitation program called Synanon that used brainwashing techniques to try and cure juvenile delinquency. There were no doctors, just staff who would use isolation, humiliation, sleep deprivation, and hard labor to try and break down troubled teens. The cult light program was shut down in the 90s, but the cycle of cruelty and abuse continued as new programs adopted the same controversial treatments. My home life was quite strict. I was staying out, running away. So my parents were afraid that I was going down the wrong path. I had a lot of anger issues at the time. I had some childhood trauma, some secrets. I was labeled a bad kid and a drug addict. I thought it was bad. Living in an abusive home, I had no idea what bad was. When I turned 15, I was sent away to a program that was advertised as a therapeutic boarding school. It was actually a warehouse with no windows where kids were tortured until they said, yes, I'm a drug addict, I'm guilty. You go into the chapel area and this little man with glasses, he is preaching hellfire and brimstone. You're gonna burn in hell. Your parents don't want you. They made us feel like we were nothing. During my three years, I experienced multiple traumas. We were forced to be a witness, a victim, and a perpetrator of abuse simultaneously. Nine in the morning till nine at night, sitting in a plastic chair, your hands on your knees, and somebody ramming their fist down your spine to make sure you sat up. The get right room was basically an isolation room, a closet. Your stay could be one day, two days, three weeks. It could be months. And there was preaching and hamunal tapes playing 24-7. I felt like I was going crazy. I can't explain to you how that feels. I'm sorry. One of the punishments for behavioral modification was wrapping us in blankets and duct tape. I was left for eight days in a blanket. There weren't bathroom breaks. My second stint in the Get Right Room, I found this paper clip. I ended up sticking that paper clip in my lower abdomen as far as I could hoping that I would hit an internal organ. I just thought suicide was better than living in this place. I was never alone. When I went to the bathroom, there were no doors on the toilets. I saw a lot of things that I can't ever unsee. I saw kids being forced to eat their vomit. I saw kittens drowned in a pond that we would have to swim in. It was all designed to dehumanize us. I just broke. I decided that I was going to take my own life. I took a bottle that said bleach and I went into the freezer and I began to drink bleach. Something just wasn't working and I spun the bottle around and it was vinegar. I was so disappointed that I was going to be stuck here forever. This is what my nightmares are made of. I will never ever be the same. Cindy, Liz, and Jody are all survivors of institutional abuse. They join us now to share their story and how they've moved on. And thank you for being here, sharing this story. I think all of you are highlighting something that some folks are naive to. I want to start with you, Cindy, because you wrote a memoir, The Dead Inside. Mm -hmm. How did you eventually get out and then move on with your life? My mother said, I'm not paying anymore. So that meant, ping, 
I was out. It took 15 years and finally meeting someone, another human who's now my husband, who I really connected with, and I finally felt safe, and that's when my brain cracked open and the memories came tumbling out. But prior to that, I was in this place, period. End of story. Just tried to operate as a normal human, but I, I wasn't. Has this been swept under the rug, or? Yeah, it's a hidden phenomenon, and, and it's basically desperate parents that are looking for a quick fix to help their kids because they believe that they can, quotes, whip them into shape in some way, Boot shape, camp. or form. Well, it's, it's like a tough love type. Tough of love, it's an authoritarian yeah. sort of uh, discipline, you know, paradigm. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, guys. It doesn't work. So that was Jody, my Jody I understand yeah. you've moved on. Can you tell us how you moved on and what you're doing now for, for survivors? Well, it took me um, a good amount of time, about 15 years, to kind of undo what was done to me. And I decided that I needed to do something to take back my life. And that something was to say, you're not alone. Uh, we can all come together and we can fight this and we can raise awareness and we can make a difference and we can stop these programs from operating. And so we work with state legislators. Well, again, Dr. Sport Kelly, to be clear, there is no basis for this type of treatment. No, there has been research over and over and over again about punishment style treatment. It does not work in the long term, we know that. I believe, Liz, you're a therapist. I am. I opened a private practice and I exclusively treat survivors of the troubled teen industry with issues related to that, and I'm a, a rarity. Um, so for the survivors that come to me, I can relate to them and I understand them, and this needs to be happening. So. One, one question I have is, how much did the facilities try to cover up the abuse so that to the outside world, if you were, let's just theoretically say, a parent who had good intentions, how much did they try to hide that from the outside world? Um, I definitely think they, uh, they hide it. They do not have to disclose to you any violations that they've been cited for or any traumas, abuse, suicides, deaths at the program. There's nothing that, that forces them to be transparent about their treatment. and what they tell you as the parent may in fact not be exactly what's happening behind closed doors. So without that, you really can't have a clear picture of where you're sending your child. And it makes so, me curious how legally. How is this legal? Well, I, I want to ask a, a different question about, because we've been talking a lot about parents. Yeah. And let's be really clear that these aren't just parents who are selecting these facilities. Oftentimes, schools are involved. And I wanted to find out from either of you three ladies, were your schools involved in making recommendations to any of these facilities? I, I can speak to that. I, the school was not involved in mine, but I deal with a lot of survivors, and I can tell you uh, that um, sometimes they can be recommended through an IEP. And then, not only that, but there's transportation services, so you can have your child taken away in the middle of the night, yeah. in handcuffs, to go to one of these yeah. places. Absolutely legal. I, I think that's an important point. I wanted to bring it up because I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that these are just parents who can't control their kids. You mentioned the IEP process. So if you're a child that has special needs, you may have an IEP through your school. That's a legal contract that guarantees you certain special education services with your school. And if you're a kid that's been diagnosed with emotional disturbance or some other kind of behavioral disorder, your school may sit down with parents and some of these educational consultants and recommend these types of facilities as a placement for you rather than being placed in your general education classroom at your typical neighborhood school. There's no federal law that governs these facilities, so it makes it very difficult, which is why uh, a recent government report talks about 34 states have reported over 1,600 staff members involved with abuse in these facilities. And, uh, you know, we talked about the places closing. And we've and had 86 documented deaths since 2000. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. We're back exposing the abuse and torment of teens in private boot camps that claim to fix behavioral problems with tough love. You just heard from survivors. But what about the parents who put their teens in these programs? One mother says doing so was the worst decision of her life.
My son loved to be outside, loved camping. He didn't skip school, he didn't do drugs, he lacked confidence. So I looked into wilderness therapy. They took children out to the wilderness, taught them all about it, and to gain confidence, that sounded like a good fit. I asked them all the questions that everybody says were the right questions. My son wanted to go to this camp. He wanted to go and have fun and learn. I was not allowed contact with my son for the first week. I had no idea he was being abused. He was asked to carry a pack that weighed a substantial amount and he needed to sit down and they told him no and they literally dragged him by the arms. I was told that no force would ever be used. Six days into the program, I got a phone call from the director that my son was having trouble breathing and to stay by the phone. 15 minutes later, I got a phone call that he was being life flighted to the hospital. My husband and I were on our way to the hospital when we got a call from the doctor and asked us to pull over. And the doctor got on the phone and said that he couldn't save him and he was sorry. My son died after being at the wilderness therapy for six days. My son was killed September 18th, which is also my birthday. I did not have any contact with my son before he died. The medical examiner's report states he had two bruises on the back of his head in the shape of the butt end of a walkie-talkie. Bruises on the back of his leg. He had bruising on his liver and his spleen. Based on the medical examiner's report, the cause of death is homicide. I got a letter two days after he died that he had written to me. After a few days here, I wanted to leave, but now it's just kind of fun. I really want to get out of here, so can you please get me out of here? Mom said they don't use physical punishment, but they do. Like on a hike, a person said, if you need to take a break, stop for a minute. Well, I did, and I got drugged the rest of the way for one and a half miles. Please help me. Love lots and always Eddie. If I had gotten that letter two days before, he might not be dead. I placed him in a position that he should have never been in. Lynn joins us now, and I think I speak for everyone when we say that we are so sorry for your loss. You say that in retrospect, this wilderness camp lied to you to get your son there. My son had a brain injury when he was younger, so I did lots of neurological testing throughout his whole life. I sent those tests to this program and asked them to review them prior to ever sending him there. And they said they did. And I talked to them on the phone for hours. And they said, oh, it's a great fit. What I do want to tell everybody, I am not a scientist or extremely bright, but I am also not a stupid mother. My son went to school every day, didn't skip, didn't do drugs. He was a good kid. He just lacked confidence. And I was told this program would do that for him. I was absolutely lied to. I will say that House Bill 3330, which I helped legislate and write and pass in Oregon, put laws into effect that these guys are supposed to follow, but there are no resources to make sure that they are. So if you think about that, the only time these laws are ever going to be put into place is when another child or person dies. And so highlighting that this abuse occurs is the first step, but then you are a parent and you're thinking, okay, well, I've heard there are some, some reputable, wonderful places to send kids, but if I'm a parent, no offense, after hearing your four stories, hell no. I'm just gonna say hell no, but I know there are some good places out there. Listen, it's true, Travis, it's true. And, and I do this in my field, and I've actually worked at residential treatment centers that were actually really, really good. And, and, and that's an important point to make because sometimes kids do need that level of care where they do need an out-of-home placement. Anytime communication is interrupted between you and your child, uh, that's a red flag for sure. There needs to be medical personnel on site at all times and available that are qualified. The program needs to be able to, without hesitation, provide you licensure credentials, um, you know, things that vouch for any adult that may come in contact with your child. Uh, another red flag is if there are other 
program participants that are responsible for enforcing any rules or sanctions or treatment of your child, that is an absolute no. Many programs use peers to provide treatment or, or peer, discipline. peer discipline. That is a no, that is a non-negotiable. Um, and you wanna make sure that the program, do your homework. My, my message really is for well-intended parents, if you know your child is struggling and, and you want to find the help that you need, do not make this decision while you are in your crisis, though you are the parent that they want. If you hear words like act now or your child will die, place them with us. A red flag is if they can claim to diagnose or you click a survey online and they say, great, you know, come to our program. My main point is if they are a good facility with good practices that are evidence-based and a positively reinforced environment, their priority is making sure that they are an appropriate level of care for your child, that your child is not an appropriate dollar sign for their bank account. This is a $1.2 billion industry, the troubled teen industry. There's 17,000 residential treatment centers out there for teens, so you really have to be so wary and really know these red flags, because like you said, not every parent is ill-intentioned, and kids are hard. The other thing, too, I want to just add is we're talking about kids who are still school-age kids. So if you're taking your kid and placing them in one of these facilities, get your school involved. And if your child has had some psychological issues or behavior issues, there should be a family doctor. So you shouldn't just be dropping your kid off without the supervision and involvement of a whole team of other professionals who can serve as checks and balances right. to make sure this facility is following and an the appropriate treatment And the one thing that I've heard in, in all of your stories is a red flag. We're gonna have all your red flags on our website. I think it's really important for Great parents to see these, but it's the idea that parents are not able to even see where they're sending their kids. They want money, yet you can't see what's going on. I want to thank all of you for sharing your stories and so sorry that you've had to go through this.